everyone finds their way uh, into joining us uh, for this meeting. And then we will start in maybe like a minute or two. I just want to say welcome in the meantime, uh, while we admit a few more of our participants into the conversation. Um, uh, for everyone else to just um, a moment of patience. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we, we thank you for you know, giving up your time. We know that there are always many uh, competing demands. Um, so uh, we uh, just, uh, as I say, wait a few minutes to um, allow for some of uh, our participants to still enter uh, into this conversation. At this point then, I think um, I'm sure that some others will be joining us in due course. Uh, it's really my privilege. Uh, you see my face. My name is Franz Fulyun. I am the director of the Center for Human Rights and uh, I will be the moderator for this event. Uh, I uh, welcome you uh, sincerely to this discussion to introduce you to the revised version of the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa developed within the context of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. I just want to say that in terms of interpretation, we have interpretation services. If you look at your bottom uh, bar, you will see um, the uh, indication there for interpretation. If you click on that, you will see you can use English, French or Portuguese. So please, if you're not familiar with this function, just look at your bar at the bottom. There is a, an indication of interpretation and you can choose your language of preference. So if you are English speaking, uh, just uh, choose English. If you are French speaking, please uh, choose French. And if you are Portuguese speaking, please uh, choose the Portuguese option. So welcome once again to all of you at this um, uh, webinar. It is presented uh, under the auspices of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And it is done in a partnership together with the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria and Article 19, in particular its Eastern and Western African offices. So I know that we are divided in time zones. So wherever you are, whatever time you are at, you're welcome. We are divided perhaps in our various stages of confinement due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think we are, despite that, virtually united and united in our concern and interest for the theme of our discussion and for the work that has gone into this uh, version of the declaration. So um, a few announcements before we dive into the substance, just as usual, please keep your uh, microphone and your camera um, closed, hidden. There will be some opportunity for participation. And then when you would be given the opportunity, please, then you must unmute and you could show us your, your face, your image as well. Please, as the discussion proceeds, you are invited, in fact, encouraged to make comments, pose questions in the chat box. The speakers will um, respond at an opportune time and everyone in the discussion would also be able to read your comments. So please, please feel free and do participate in um, the discussion by making your comments and put your question, questions there. Um, so the... Um, Procedure will be that each of our speakers, and you would have seen on the program that there are five speakers, each will have um, uh, around 10 minutes to talk to an aspect of the declaration. Thereafter, we'll have some uh, reference to questions and discussion points in the chat box. We'll perhaps allow some of the uh, participants to raise hands and participate in the discussion. And lastly, we'll just have a short uh, a roundup of comments, maybe very short one minute comments from our panelists. So um, then very briefly to say the, the, the structure of the event, Commissioner Mute 
Uh, the first speaker, I'll introduce him in a second. He will speak about the general principles and the background history to the declaration. The next speaker will be Fatou Jai, who will speak about the freedom of expression part of the declaration. Uh, she will be followed by Mugambi Kiai, who will speak about the access to information aspects, followed by Maxwell Kadiri, who will speak to the online dimension uh, of the declaration. And lastly, Klingiwe Dube will speak about the way forward, including aspects related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So once again, welcome to those of you who have joined us just now. We are here to look at and be introduced to the uh, Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa in its revised new format. And uh, to take us through the origins, background, and the general principles of the Declaration, we ask uh, Commissioner uh, Lawrence Mute to take the floor. I think he needs very little introduction to those of us working in this field. He is the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa of the African Commission. He has been the pivot around which the work has been undertaken in this regard. Um, and uh, I think <clears throat> he will then speak to the uh, bigger picture. Uh, over to you, Commissioner Mute. Thank you uh, very much, Professor, and a good morning to everybody. Now, um, so a good morning to everybody. Good morning, bonjour, obrigada, habari akila mtu. Uh, you will hear, even as I begin, there's someone who is speaking in the background who I'm trying to mute uh, because uh, that's my screen reader. I hope it does not interfere too much with uh, uh, me speaking to you. So yes, let me begin by um, again. In One moment. Uh, Franz, do you hear all the background noise from uh, Joyce, Jaws? Just oh, Commissioner, we are fine. We oh, can hear fine. you quite clearly. Thank you. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Okay. So I'll not worry about that. So yes, let me begin by um, again saying that uh, my name is Lawrence Muta. Usually um, my day job is at the School of Law of the University of Nairobi. And uh, I have been the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and access to information in Africa for the last uh, couple of years. Now, um, I wish then also to begin by welcoming all of you uh, to this webinar and also thanking you for uh, finding time uh, from all those other webinars, there are so many. So the fact that uh, you've been able to uh, come or participate in this one, we really do appreciate. Also uh, thanking the the Secretariat of the Commission, the African Commission uh, in Banjul, and uh, uh, the partners uh, who are part of this uh, webinar, uh, the Center for Human Rights, uh, Article 19 East Africa, and also Article 19 West Africa. So my role is uh, to provide a background for the Declaration on Principles of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. So I'll be explaining uh, the declaration's uh, uh, scope, its purpose. I'll also be introducing uh, the general principles of the declaration. Now, um, when I think about my mandate as a special reporter uh, on uh, freedom of expression and access to information in Africa, this mandate has remained remained seized of a broad range of uh, violations and abuses of Article 9 of the African Charter uh, on Human and Post Rights. Uh, as you know, Article 9 of the Charter guarantees individuals the right to receive information, as well as the right to express 
and disseminate information. Now, when you think about violations, so these would be acts which are perpetrated by states, or you think about abuses uh, which are perpetrated by non-state actors, um, these have been manifest in various ways. Article 9 violations or abuses. Uh, you'd be thinking about uh, attacks on journalists. You'd be thinking about uh, criminal defamation laws. The quite difficult question of censorship. And so here you're speaking about direct censorship, uh, either perhaps soft censorship or indeed self censorship. Uh, shutdowns of legacy uh, media. So this will be broadcast, uh, this will be print, but also a shutdown or restrictions of social media. Uh, the whole question of denial of uh, information to citizens and also other forms of state overreach. So these are the sorts of things which uh, we've needed to keep uh, dealing with. Now, when I think about uh, the time I have uh, served as a member of the African Commission, my sense is that um, many of the human rights violations which happen on the continent do not continue to happen because of uh, an absence of norms and standards, at least at the continental level. When you look at the last three or more decades, um, African human rights uh, institutions, uh, a lot of the time being spearheaded by the African Commission, have established a rich corpus of hard and soft law instruments, uh, which set out uh, the normative and the procedural basis uh, for ensuring human rights on the continent. Now, of course, then this becomes the basis on which domestic legislation uh, becomes enab uh, enabled, becomes legislated um, in respect of uh, Article 9 of the African Charter. In fact, I think at this point, I would need to commend uh, Namibia, uh, which is the latest state to enact uh, access to information legislation. Now, what has been happening in the last few years and uh, which uh, became a, a reality last year is that you have now this further key normative component for anchoring Article 9 of the Charter. And this was realized in uh, 2019, last year, when the African Commission adopted the Declaration on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. Um, the Declaration provides further elaboration on the scope and content of Article 9 of the Charter. This declaration replaces the Declaration on Freedom of Expression in Africa, uh, which was adopted by the Commission as far or as long ago as 2002. So obviously then what one asks is what has changed in the last two decades, which made it necessary for the Commission to develop a new declaration. And you know, during that time, what has happened is that you've had major new developments emerging. Um, so you have uh, uh, issues which were completely unaddressed uh, by the previous declaration, which or which were insufficiently addressed by the previous uh, declaration. So in the last six or seven years, there have been a couple of uh, resolutions of a commission, uh, particularly resolution 222, and also resolution 362, essentially asking the commission uh, develop a new normative standard. And as you develop that new normative standard, take account particularly of the internet, because that was not covered at all. Also take account of access to information issues, again, which were not covered uh, properly, substantively. So this is a context then within which uh, in the last uh, um, one to two years, a, a special rapporteur, I convened meetings in, uh, in a number of places, in Noachot, uh, in Mombasa, uh, in uh, Maputo, uh, in uh, Vindok, um, and a few other places, including Gambia, and also uh, there are meetings in uh, uh, Sham El Sheikh as part of one of the ordinary sessions. Um, all of these, and apart from that also, communicating directly with states using not verbals, not verbals, uh, and also using a, a, a virtual means. 
And on this basis, we collected um, uh, views, we worked with, with, with the technical uh, team, which then in due course led to a declaration draft, which was adopted by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights uh, uh, last year. Now, I should also point out, of course, that in terms of these normative developments uh, and instruments of the Commission, particularly which focus on Article 9 of the African Charter, you would already know that uh, we had um, the model law on uh, uh, access to information. Uh, we also had the uh, guidelines uh, which focus specifically on uh, elections, uh, uh, information and elections. So these again were two standards which had already been developed uh, by the African Commission. So the point there is it's about new areas of new issues uh, arising. Uh, it's also about uh, developments uh, around the jurisprudence of the Commission uh, and also jurisprudence uh, which uh, was developed by the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Then taking all of that and putting it together uh, as now this new standard uh, which we're introducing today. Now in terms then of scope, uh, just quickly to say, because uh, my colleagues will be looking at this, that uh, uh, the declaration itself is divided no. into five parts. Uh, part one no. uh, of the declaration establishes the general principles which apply uh, to the whole declaration. I'll be, I'll be mentioning that in a moment or two. Then part two uh, sets out uh, principles on freedom of expression, while part three sets out uh, principles on uh, access to information. Then you have part four addressing uh, freedom of expression and access to information on the internet. And finally, part five establishing principles uh, on the declarations implementation. So um, if I can then uh, um, uh, speak to the general principles, um, one of the difficulties which repeatedly arises when uh, one is moderating a process for drafting uh, an instrument is you have all these various proposals. It's almost a, an instinct, an overkill instinct, where each person insists we must in each principle include, you know, these limitations, or we must include this principle under every uh, principle that uh, is captured in the in the in, in this case in the declaration. So people say, uh, wait a minute, you've not included a, a particular issue in this principle which you are drafting. And so then what happens, of course, is that that is not elegant in terms of drafting. And also, you know, it gets in the way, it becomes quite messy. So then what uh, we did in this case was to say that we'll have certain key principles which would, would apply across the whole declaration. And so we identified nine such principles, uh, including principle one, which undergirds the declaration, uh, which affirms that the respect, protection, and fulfillment of the rights to freedom of expression and access to information is crucial and indispensable for the free development of the human person, uh, the creation and nurturing of democratic societies, and for enabling the exercise of other rights. And you will see this, in a sense, is in line with Article 1 uh, of the African Charter, which establishes you know, states' obligations um, uh, uh, and which, for example, therefore requires state parties to create environments to enable effective uh, exercise of uh, uh, these particular rights. Now, as far as principle two is concerned, this restates a truism uh, in respect of perhaps one of the most misunderstood elements of freedom of expression. Now, so you have freedom of expression but then also you have freedom of opinion. And the point which this principle makes is that uh, freedom of opinion is an unlimitable right. So freedom of opinion, which includes the right to form and change all forms of opinion at any time and for whatever reason, is an unlimitable right which states may not interfere with. Now, of course, the distinction then which is made is between um, opinion, which cannot be limited because opinion is in your head, it's what you're thinking. But on the other hand, expression of opinion, which may be limited. 
you know, for example, you know, around uh, prohibited speech, which is a discussion, which is an issue also which is covered in the, uh, in the declaration. Principle three resonates with the anti-discrimination clause in Article two of the African Charter, um, which uh, focuses on uh, everyone's right to exercise freedom of expression and access to information without uh, discrimination. And this discrimination will not happen one should not be distinguished to be discriminated um, on one or other ground. And then you have a long list of grounds which are framed in an inclusive way. And I think the point to make here is that uh, if you look at uh, the language uh, uh, of uh, the anti-discrimination provisions, uh, which are captured in the commission soft law instruments, they are extremely inclusive. You know, they cover, uh, you know, various, uh, grounds uh, which usually are the basis for discrimination and so uh, this i think is a standard which uh, is continued here uh, quickly principle four establishing that where a conflict arises between any domestic and international human rights law the most favorable provision for the full exercise of the rights to freedom of expression or access to information shall prevail now this formulation again uh, resonates with the Article 31 of the Maputo Protocol, you know, which are similar language. I think uh, some of you may know, for example, in the instance, I, I believe, of South Africa, uh, where concerns have been raised that uh, certain provisions in the Maputo Protocol establish a lower standard than the standard which is in the South African Constitution. So again, then, that the point becomes uh, that we include this principle to take account of that sort of situation. Uh, principle five, serving a reminder that exercise of the rights to freedom of expression and access to information takes place online as much as offline. So what you need to do, uh, you need to understand this principle also by looking at the preambular paragraph, which affirms that the rights that people have offline should be protected online and in accordance with international human uh, rights uh, law. Uh, principle six, uh, here again, there was a lot of concern. When you speak sometimes about freedom of expression, there's a misunderstanding that actually we are speaking about journalist rights. When in fact, what we're speaking about are the rights of every person to be able to express themselves. So again, that's a context within which that formulation includes protection of human rights defenders and also others uh, you know, who may wish to exercise that freedom of expression. Um, a, a principle seven, the declaration recognizes that certain individuals or groups may face particular prejudice on account of their characteristics or circumstances. So here we are speaking about uh, uh, people uh, who therefore may require specific interventions to ensure that um, on account of marginalization, then they are not, they, 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 to protect them from uh, uh, being stopped from exercising their right to, uh, to express themselves. Here we are speaking about, uh, you know, women, we are speaking about people with disabilities, and, you know, there's a list which is set out there. Again, this resonates with the, um, 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 the other instruments of the, of the, of the, of the, of the uh, other human rights instruments, uh, whether it's the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, uh, the Disability Protocol. Um, in the same vein, you have principle eight, which requires states to recognize and respect the evolving capacities of children and um. May I just remind everyone, please, to mute your microphones if you are not the speaker and to also close your video. We, care, we have some noises in the background uh, and um, please um, mute your microphone and Commissioner Mute, mute please.
Commissioner Mute, uh, your microphone is muted at the moment. Um, if you could conclude and um, just unmute, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Thank you, please. Okay, so quickly, then uh, um, I think principle nine, extremely important because it sets out uh, justifiable limitations um, of the rights to freedom of expression and access to information. So here we are speaking about, uh, uh, you know, uh, limitations. Um, and uh, we have a series of communications, which in the commission, uh, communications, meaning cases uh, at the commission, which actually have affirmed the importance uh, of uh, the situation that where uh, limitations uh, need to be used, then uh, they, are, they, they must um, take account of a certain uh, minimum uh, requirements. And uh, for this purpose, you then have uh, what we call, uh, you know, the three-part test, which is set out in that particular uh, Article 9, uh, that, uh, you know, for a, a right may not be uh, limited, unless the limitation is uh, uh, prescribed by law. And then there's specificity on what exactly being prescribed by law is. Because what we've seen in the past is uh, our courts and also our parliaments being quite vague about this uh, uh, formulation of what exactly is prescription by law. And then also that such limitations must serve a legitimate aim. And uh, finally, that uh, such limit, uh, limitation, must be necessary and proportionate uh, uh, way of achieving the stated aim in a democratic society. So um, I think I should stop. I, I suspect I've taken more time than I should have. Um, but uh, we can continue having uh, these uh, discussions um, um, in the next couple of hours. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mute, for that introduction. Uh, welcoming anyone who has joined us uh, in the interim to this uh, discussion on the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. If you look at the chat box, you'll also see that um, the uh, website where one can find the four versions of uh, the Declaration has been posted. Also, obviously, on the website of the African Commission should be available. So um, we move along um, to the uh, second speaker, that is uh, Fatou uh, Jai. Uh, she is the director of Article 19's West Africa office. Um, she has uh, extensive experience in the area of uh, human rights, more than two decades. And I, I think she's also one of the people that had been around when, in fact, the original uh, drafting of the uh, document that is now uh, appearing in revised form he, um, had been assembled. So uh, Fatu uh, will speak um, around the ap aspect of freedom of expression as set out in the um, declaration. And I just remind everyone else, please, to mute your microphones um, so that we can hear the speaker well. Over to you, Fatu. Thank you very much, uh, Franz. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Mute and all the colleagues from across Africa and the world. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure to participate in this webinar in this uh, very unique context. Uh, indeed, uh, freedom of expression is important in normal time, but it's more important in specific time, especially this time where access to information, uh, freedom of journalists to move around has been challenged across Africa. And this declaration in its revived form is really coming uh, at a very, very crucial time. Um, the part that I'm going to introduce here is the part uh, on freedom of expression. Oh, je devais parler français. Uh, okay, uh, je dois parler français, please. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yes. let me interrupt you for one second, uh -huh. reminding all our 
viewers, all our participants, that there's a function for interpretation at the bottom. If you came late, you can click on it, and there's the option. If you are an English speaker, just click on English. If you are a French speaker, click on English, and there's Portuguese. So you'll hear that language being translated. Merci beaucoup. Uh, OK, je dois parler français. J'avais oublié pour la diversité aussi. Alors, je vais... Uh, je... Euh, j'ai déjà, euh, déjà introduit ce que je voulais commencer par dire. Est-ce que c'est normal que j'entende l'interprète? Non, I should not know, because I should not hear you, non? C'est bon? I'm hearing your voice, which I don't think uh, is normal, it will distract me. Ok, c'est bon? Ouais. Donc, ok, je vais, euh, donc je vais euh, parler de, de la partie. On commence à partir du principe 10 jusqu'au 25. Et si vous regardez euh, le premier, la première déclaration, vous avez euh, vu qu'elle a été restructurée en quelque sorte, étoffé aussi pour prendre en compte un certain nombre d'éléments que le commissaire Moutet a, a, a rappelé au début de son propos. Alors, un, un certain nombre de constances quand même qu'on pourrait rappeler. Euh, le principe 10 euh, rappelle euh, la nature fondamentale euh, de la liberté d'expression en tant que droits humains, euh, fondamentale pour la réalisation d'un certain nombre d'autres droits, mais aussi cruciale pour euh, la démocratie et l'état de droit. Donc, je pense que ce principe pose clairement le ton et montre en quelque sorte l'importance de cette liberté dans, 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 dans l'architecture des droits humains. Il est vrai que lorsqu'on parle de la liberté d'expression, on parle d'un droit de chacun, mais quand même le rôle des médias est crucial. Et cette déclaration s'y penche énormément. Il est vrai qu'il y a un certain équilibre qui est donné, mais la partie qui est relative à la liberté d'expression parle beaucoup des médias. Pourquoi c'est important Parce que les médias, quand même, c'est le premier véhicule de l'information. C'est un, un, un des acteurs, un des euh, acteurs importants pour permettre aux citoyens, aux individus de pouvoir accéder à l'information. Et dans cette déclaration, notamment sur le rôle des médias, euh, on a noté le rappel d'un certain nombre de fondamentaux qu'il faut peut-être ici citer. D'abord, la question de la diversité qui est très menacée partout dans le monde aujourd'hui avec l'avènement des nouveaux médias, avec un peu euh, la convergence. Donc, le principe rappelle l'importance de la diversité dans le secteur des médias. Mais aussi, la question euh, de la, de, 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 du service public. On oublie souvent, on oublie souvent que le, le, le service public doit avoir un certain nombre d'attributs, notamment la question de son indépendance, la question de sa gouvernance, mais aussi la question même de l'accès de tous les citoyens et de, tous les, de tout le monde au service public des médias. Ça a été réitéré. La première déclaration révisée en a parlé, mais cette déclaration le détaille avec un peu plus de précision, non seulement sur ce que doit être le service public, ce mode de gouvernance, mais aussi la question de son financement. Uh, et uh, toujours pour approfondir sur cette, uh, sur cette question uh, des médias, toujours, uh, la, la déclaration élabore en quelque sorte et rappelle l'importance d'un cadre juridique favorable, des cadres favorables notamment pour uh, 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 réduire les restrictions et faire en sorte que ces restrictions puissent respecter uh, les principes fondamentaux qui ont été rappelés tout à l'heure, c'est-à-dire la règle des trois par test, c'est-à-dire prévu par la loi, être nécessaire dans une société démocratique et poursuivre un intérêt légitime. Le commissaire Moutet l'a rappelé tout à l'heure dans son, dans son avant-propos. C'est juste pour dire, en quelque sorte aussi, ce rappel par rapport à la régulation des médias est très, très crucial. De plus en plus, les États continuent à légiférer euh, sur euh, euh, les médias et ne respectent pas souvent cette règle importante lorsqu'il s'agit euh, d'un certain nombre de limitations. Qui dit média aussi dit pouvoir économique, dit aussi besoin euh, d'un cadre favorable pour s'épanouir et aussi pour 
pouvoir euh, pérenniser ces, ces activités. Les médias coûtent cher sur tout l'audiovisuel. Et donc, la déclaration se penche aussi sur la question de, 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 des, des aspects économiques. C'est-à-dire, les États aussi doivent créer des mesures ou bien accompagner les médias à, à travers différents mécanismes, que ce soit l'aide directe, les aides indirectes, à travers les réductions fiscales, à travers un certain nombre d'autres aspects pour permettre aux médias de ne pas s'écrouler et de pouvoir vivre correctement et servir les intérêts publics. Le dernier point par rapport aux mesures prises qui doivent être prises par les États par rapport aux médias, c'est aussi la question de, de, de l'équité au niveau de, de l'attribution des, des fréquences. Aujourd'hui, nous parlons du digital, de moins en moins, nous parlons de fréquences classiques, mais je pense que c'est important de rappeler quand même, dans beaucoup de pays africains, euh, nous parlons toujours de ces questions-là et c'est important qu'on le rappelle. Donc, la règle des trois, des trois parts, c'est-à-dire que les États, lorsqu'ils octroient euh, des, des, des licences euh, d'exploitation de, aux médias, ils ne doivent pas tout donner au privé. Il faut qu'on qu puisse parler d'un certain équilibrage. Il est radio communautaire. Euh, le, 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 les médias communautaires doivent jouer un rôle important et on doit prévoir aussi un certain nombre de, 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 de fréquences pour que ces médias puissent aussi exister et, et vivre correctement. Le service public, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, est crucial pour la cohésion nationale, pour un certain nombre d'enjeux, lorsque surtout, surtout lorsque il est indépendant il est accessible à tout le monde et il est gouverné de manière transparente et, euh, et, et aussi euh, qu'il puisse aussi avoir son, son indépendance économique. À la déclaration, euh, réitère, la première déclaration en parlait, mais vraiment en filigrane. Mais là, la déclaration l'élabore de manière beaucoup plus précise, c'est-à-dire la question de l'autorégulation. Euh, c'est le moyen, c'est la méthode qui est beaucoup plus favorable, surtout lorsqu'on parle de l'Internet, lorsqu'on parle aussi des de, de médias, euh, de, la, de la presse écrite. C'est ce qui est favorable euh, davantage, de plus en plus, les normes internationales encouragent les États à permettre aux professionnels des médias de s'autoréguler et d'élaborer de, de, leur propre code de conduite, euh, de, 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 de mettre en place des mécanismes entre les pairs et de s'autoréguler, parce que l'autorégulation aussi responsabilise et permet aux journalistes et aux professionnels de la communication de se corriger et ça crée moins de contraintes et moins d'arbitraires. De, moins de, moins de, euh, de, euh, la régulation, euh, pour, surtout pour l'audiovisuel et les télécommunications, est aussi cruciale. Euh, elle a été euh, euh, présente dans la première déclaration. Elle est beaucoup plus détaillée dans cette déclaration avec euh, un certain nombre de précisions sur le mode de fonctionnement des organes de régulation des médias audiovisuels surtout, mais aussi la composition des organes de, de, de gouvernance, c'est-à-dire leur conseil d'administration. Tout ceci vraiment pour renforcer euh, que ce soit euh, des organes indépendants des États qui ne créent pas l'arbitraire et qui puissent permettre au secteur de se développer et pas d'être contraint de manière arbitraire. Une innovation de la déclaration, et, euh, et, et c'est l'autorégulation. De plus en plus, on le voit dans beaucoup de pays, on s'achemine vers l'autorégulation. La, l'autorégulation, c'est aussi un moyen de, de rapprocher euh, les, les, euh, les, 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 les professionnels de la communication de la régulation étatique. Ce qu'on voyait souvent, ça veut dire qu'il y avait une friction entre les organes de régulation qui souvent dans les pays n'étaient pas indépendants, et les organes d'autorégulation des professionnels qui souvent aussi manquaient un peu d'efficacité, un peu de pouvoir de sanction par rapport à leur père. Donc je pense que cette innovation de la déclaration est salutaire parce qu'elle elle, elle encourage en quelque sorte les autorités, mais aussi les acteurs à venir ensemble pour pouvoir de manière transparente parler des médias et aussi de, 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 la, de la façon dont ces derniers doivent être gérés, régulés dans l'intérêt du, du public. Le, le point essentiel aussi, lorsqu'on parle de cette liberté, lorsqu'on parle de tous ces, de tous ces droits, lorsqu'ils s'exercent, il faut un certain nombre de protections. Et la déclaration y revient avec force, c'est-à-dire la protection contre les violences contre les journalistes. Elle, elle traite de manière assez claire la question de l'impunité et montre aux États les, les, les voies à suivre 
pour lutter contre l'impunité lorsqu'il y a des, des crimes, des violences contre les journalistes. Et je pense que c'est aussi euh, important. La première déclaration y parlait, et celle-ci aussi le réitère avec beaucoup plus de détails et de précision. Euh, les, deux, 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 les deux derniers points sur lesquels peut-être je vais m'apesantir, c'est les mesures économiques. Euh, le commissaire a parlé tout à l'heure euh, des, 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 euh, des mesures euh, que les États doivent prendre pour ne pas restreindre de manière arbitraire la liberté d'expression. Mais au-delà de ces mesures, les États aussi ont une obligation positive de faire en sorte que, à travers des moyens économiques, à travers d'autres mécanismes, d'accompagner les médias pour faire en sorte que ces médias puissent prospérer et, euh, et, et, et se développer. Mais ces mesures aussi doivent euh, être euh, faites ou être prises et, et mises en œuvre de manière assez transparente. Nous avons vu dans beaucoup de pays, il y a beaucoup de mesures économiques, mais souvent ces mesures ne sont pas euh, gérées ou bien ne sont pas mises en œuvre de manière euh, euh, transparente. La publicité d'État, par exemple, est attribuée souvent à des organes de presse qui sont beaucoup plus favorables au pouvoir. La déclaration parle de ces publicités, euh, de, euh, surtout euh, étatiques. La déclaration parle aussi des mesures que les États doivent prendre pour éviter le monopole. Les monopoles créent des situations, euh, de, 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 les situations économiques anticoncurrentielles, mais aussi euh, cassent en quelque sorte, les dynamiques de diversité. La déclaration parle tant des monopoles, que la concentration soit verticale ou horizontale. Tous ces aspects sont détaillés de manière assez précise dans, dans, ce, dans cette nouvelle version de la déclaration. Un point sur lequel je vais peut-être m'apesantir et peut-être m'arrêter, je pense, c'est la protection des sources, cruciale avec des garanties supplémentaires pour dire que la protection des sources journalistes est un principe fondamental pour que les médias puissent exercer leurs droits, leurs professions, et pour permettre à l'information de pouvoir circuler et que ceux qui ont des informations d'intérêt public qui puissent les partager. Et donc, pour que tout ceci puisse se faire dans les règles de l'art, il faut un système, un régime de protection des sources efficace, c'est-à-dire une protection. Euh, qui, est, qui est garanti par la loi. Et dans la déclaration, euh, ce, ce principe est réitéré de manière assez, assez, assez détaillée et c'est euh, dans le principe 25 sur lequel je vais finir. Donc, c'est juste pour dire cette déclaration euh, dans ces différents principes du, du principe 10 au 25 élabore euh, beaucoup sur la liberté d'expression mais donne quand même une importance capitale au rôle des médias, comment ces médias doivent être structurés, comment le, ils doivent être protégés, mais aussi leur, leur, responsabilité, leur responsabilité. Un autre point par rapport à la responsabilité des médias, c'est le régime des sanctions. Parce que quand même, qui parle de liberté, qui parle d'un certain nombre de mesures économiques à prendre par les États pour soutenir les médias, parle aussi d'un certain nombre de responsabilités qui est lié à la liberté d'expression. Et euh, ceci euh, est, est au niveau des sanctions prévues euh, par, les, euh, par les législations, mais qui doivent être euh, entourées. Et la déclaration rappelle aux États que les sanctions peuvent être légitimes, mais ne doivent pas, en quelque sorte, anéantir ce droit et doivent se faire, doivent être prises dans des conditions spécifiques par, par rapport à la diffamation. La déclaration indique effectivement comment les règles qui régissent, la diffama, qui régissent la diffamation doivent être à, 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 à mises en œuvre et quelles sont les conditions pour utiliser ces, 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 ces règles, mais aussi euh, comment ces règles doivent être euh, délimitées pour éviter des abus et éviter aussi que ceux qui sont au pouvoir ou, ceux, ou, ou les, les pouvoirs d'argent plutôt puissent utiliser ces règles de diffamation pour ne pas être aussi transparent pour ne pas être redevable. Les autres aspects aussi liés toujours aux limitations, la question cruciale du discours de la haine. Nous savons que aussi la liberté d'expression, oui, mais aussi la liberté d'expression a des limites. Et l'une des, des limitations reconnues et acceptées, c'est aussi que la, la liberté d'expression ne doit pas être utilisée pour euh, encourager le discours de la haine 
les discriminations, entre autres. Ceci aussi, c'est euh, un aspect crucial. Et comment ces règles euh, sur la, le discours de la haine doivent être utilisées, euh, la déclaration aussi en parle et donne des, des lignes directrices assez claires aux États qui souhaitent élaborer euh, davantage leur législation sur cette question qui est très, très délicate, mais importante aussi. Nous l'avons vu, non? de plus en plus, les États utilisent beaucoup le discours de la haine pour restreindre la liberté d'expression. Le fait de le détailler de cette façon aussi nous permet d'avoir des lignes claires par rapport à, 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 à cette question-là. Je pense que à, sur euh, euh, la partie euh, qui me concerne, j'ai essayé tantôt de, de résumer euh, les, les, les grandes lignes et pendant les discussions, nous pourrons, nous pourrons élaborer davantage. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much, Fatou, for uh, giving us that background um, to uh, the uh, issues around freedom of expression in the Declaration. Uh, welcome to anyone who has joined us and reminding everyone, please, to just keep your microphones muted if you are not uh, the one speaking. Our next speaker um, in the series uh, of speakers will be Mugambi Kiai, uh, who is the director of the Article 19 Eastern Africa office, and uh, who is an expert, among other things, on access to information. So it is on the access to information part of the declaration that uh, Mugambi will focus. The floor is yours, please. Thank you, Prof. Um, let me start by congratulating um, Commissioner Mute and the team that uh, drafted and canvassed uh, for this declaration. Uh, my own view is that it's a very progressive uh, uh, piece um, in terms of just a norm building and building of new standards. Um, as, Prof had, um, um, as Commissioner had noted earlier, there were gaps uh, coming from the original declaration of 2002 that needs to be filled. And, and one of the key pieces there was around access uh, to information. Uh, just to circle back um, and, you know, just highlight the tension between the pool on one side uh, for secrecy, to create secrecy, um, which largely ha happens um, and it's largely driven by state actors, but, but some non-state actors also are clear uh, perpetrators of that. And the other one that calls for greater transparency and accountability, which is why we try and, and, and create this, this, these norms that, that essentially highlight um, and go into elaboration of what we think uh, should be focused on uh, in terms of just providing uh, the public with the information. Um, it's, it's, you know, before I, you know, I, I go into the substantive bits around uh, the declaration, let me highlight um, this piece around where we are coming from. And I think uh, Commissioner Mute actually spoke about it. Um, we have countries, we have territories where, you know, even newspapers in public offices are stamped confidential. Um, today, they, we have big debates around uh, the size and nature of public debt uh, and public finance. Uh, what, what do these uh, agreements that government sign, what do they say? What have we ceded? What have we given away, you know, uh, as security? There's questions around um, uh, you know, public bodies tendering, uh, procuring, contracting, and public expenditure. We always ask questions, and I'm not sure we get all the right answers. Um, there's been issues around whistleblowing. What do we do with the information we get from whistleblowers? How do we treat whistleblowers? There's been questions around uh, retention and preservation of, of of the information that relates to the public interest. Where is this information stored? How is it stored? 
how do we access it? There's also questions around um, uh, contracts that, that go into mining and the exploitation of, of other public, uh, public, uh, public resources. Um, this has been a key area where, again, transparency has been sought, agreements have been, uh, have, have been made but not uh, uh, accessed to those who uh, uh, incidentally have not just uh, a personal interest for, for some people and communities, but also for the public good in terms of the larger public interest and national interest. There's been questions around how uh, public hiring and public recruitment is done. There's questions around uh, elections and the man management of information related to elections. And this is not just about results, but it's, it's, it's also about, um, you know, uh, uh, registers uh, of, of, of voters. Um, it's, it's about how, how all this uh, uh, vote, uh, um, managers of, of electoral management uh, bodies uh, are selected. So there's a whole raft and panoply of, of information that, that we need always to, to ask ourselves. Um, how is it that um, these decisions or this information um, is accessible uh, to, uh, to the public? Now, uh, in addressing this, when we look at this declaration, um, we find that at um, principle 26, um, there is um, that statement that the right to access to information shall be guaranteed by law. Again, that has been a big uh, struggle and challenge for a lot of, of, of us who um, have always stated that it, there needs to be uh, the anchorage of this provision uh, actually at constitutional uh, level because uh, to get proper enforcement, uh, uh, proper compliance, we need to make sure that this, you know, this principle of, of the right to information and, and the right to access to information uh, is, is given due hierarchy in terms of regard uh, by the legal and constitutional frameworks uh, that affect all of us. Now, um, I think in this principle, uh, apart from anchoring it in law, the other uh, key, um, key issues are, are around that this information is, is what is held by public bodies and relevant uh, uh, private bodies. Um, I, again, uh, I, I think uh, Commissioner Muted noted uh, that there would always be a struggle in terms of the drafting of, of uh, the language here. Uh, I think when you look at this provision, you can see that there is that move to make sure that uh, we, we define the relevant uh, private body uh, as elaborately as possible. Um, whether we succeed in making sure that there's optimal accountability is, is a question I think we will ask down the, uh, down the road. Um, but from the very outset around this uh, part three, we find that the right uh, to access to information is, is clearly stated in terms of where it's supposed to be anchored. In principle 27, uh, what, what happens is that this uh, right is given precedence over any other law that may restrict disclosure of information. In these cases, where you find that there is a, that tension between access to information and secrecy, uh, what the declaration is saying is that, is that um, primacy should be given to access to information, which I think is, 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 is the correct position. Uh, principle 28 talks about maximum disclosure and talks about how, um, in terms of access to information, uh, you know, as much information as is possible should be disclosed. And where it's not uh, done, there should be strict limitation to the restriction in terms of disclosure. Uh, we then move to questions around proactive disclosure and what uh, the obligation that is specified there is that uh, you do not need to have requests made. Um, what the you know, public bodies and those, uh, those 
you know, uh, those that are required to, to provide information should do is proactively provide the information. And um, very, very clearly, this should be done um, through all mediums. Uh, so both digital and other media. Um, and uh, uh, for, for this purpose, um, what, what you have in terms of, of proactive disclosure is... Mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, I'm hearing... Uh, let me just ask everyone to um, unmute except for our speaker. Uh, please, uh, Mugambi, continue. All right. So, so, so the whole the whole principle around around proactive disclosure, uh, I think, uh, is is very well made um, in in the declaration. Um, we then uh, go to the next piece. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my. I have lost my my page there. Just uh, give me a second. Um, we then go uh, to, to the whole issue around um, how we keep information. I think part of the the big issue we've had around management of public information has been around uh, ensuring that it is kept in a manner that <clears throat> can be accessed. And uh, it's organized in a manner that is accessible. So again, that is addressed uh, under principle 30. Um, and, and one of the, I think, uh, key issues for us has been around destruction of, of information, especially where that information um, perhaps does not flatter uh, the public authority or the, or the private entity that is, uh, is, is seeking uh, uh, to keep away that information. Uh, under uh, principle 31, uh, I think there is a, a full description around how to access information. Um, so again, the whole issue around making sure that people are assisted to make requests, that uh, those who are not literate and people with disabilities are also assisted, um, and that when it comes to costs, these are reduced to the largest uh, uh, possible uh, extent. I think this will be very useful also um, uh, just in the processes that we are in, because one of the issues has always been when you request for information, there's been normally two, two ways that uh, are used to avoid uh, 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 you know, giving that information. The first one has, has been that, you know, you use cost. The other one, of course, is that you're given so much information that it is no longer useful uh, for you to use. So I think the development of this principle goes to address uh, uh, that piece. If um, access to information is denied, uh, principle 32 says that there should be an appeal me mechanism for the refusal of this. I think again is very welcome. Hopefully, again, um, time limits to make sure that this is also not abused uh, will also be a function of this principle, uh, because again, these kinds of processes are, are, uh, can be unduly delayed to ensure that uh, you know the, the usefulness or utility of the information is not secured. The principle around exemption, which is principle 33. I think uh, is one that we need to pay huge attention to. Uh, again, uh, when we discussed the general principle, uh, it was laid down there uh, pretty succinctly uh, and pretty, pretty clearly in terms of making sure that, that we ensure that the limitations are always specific, uh, they're not unreasonable, um, and there's, there's, proper, there's a proper rationale. So this principle, I think, goes deeper when you look at the eight uh, provisions it provides um, on, on when it is uh, okay not to disclose information. So there's issues around 
uh, personal information, so unreasonable disclosure of, of personal information of a third party, where you can cause commercial or financial uh, uh, prejudice to uh, some interests. Um, questions around life, health, safety of individuals. Uh, questions around national security and defense, um, where you can cause substantial, substantial prejudice to international relations, uh, prejudice to law enforcement, uh, where there's privileged information uh, uh, that is legally recognized. And, and the, the, there's a whole question around uh, professional examination or recruitment processes that uh, need, we need to preserve, where you need to preserve the internet. So for all this, I, I think I, I, I want to, to applaud the fact that we have gone into uh, creating a template that, that substantially provides uh, a, you know, a, 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 a basis to say uh, or to, to judge whether you know, I, 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 a refusal to, to, to provide information um, is, is legitimate or not. So I, I think that's, that's very, uh, uh, um, it's, it's very progressive in, in my view. Um, and then we go to providing an oversight uh, mechanism. Uh, Mugabe, if I may ask you to just uh, round up, uh, okay. we will have question and discussion time afterwards so that we can get through all the speakers. Uh, thank you so much for summarizing. All right. So uh, then we've got uh, the provision for an oversight mechanism um, and the whole question around, let me, let me uh, uh, also point out uh, principle 35 around uh, protected disclosures where whistleblowers, I think, need protection. Uh, the key point is, is it is not for us to look at why a whistleblower does that. It is for us to make sure that they are protected. And then we provide for sanctions uh, under principle 36, where you know, um, these provisions have not been uh, uh, adhered to. My last comment um, on, on this um, has to do with the fact, uh, and I think uh, Commissioner Mutte noted this, that when we look at the, you know, the, the, this, this whole framework, is to ask ourselves, uh, like when it comes to the United Nations, we have saved ourselves from the challenges, the issues that that face us. So it's not whether this will this document will take us to heaven, but whether it will save us from hell. And I think uh, as we go down and we look at the other provisions around implementation, um, this is where the rubber will hit the road, and we will get those answers. But I will stop there and again congratulate the team that um, drafted and pushed uh, for this declaration. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I could ask that you just stop sharing your screen, Mugambi. Uh, just, I think your screen is shared. You can just stop screening, uh, sharing it. Okay. While we wait for that, just to, to note that uh, we see people in the chat room just um, announcing their presence and uh, drawing from the furthest corners just to note the presence of people from as far afield as uh, Ireland and as India, and then also representing uh, the continent as a whole. We see representatives from a number of countries such as Cameroon, um, Sierra Leone, and others and welcome to everyone. We are uh, going down the list of our speakers. We come to uh, the uh, fourth speaker um, and that is Maxwell Kadiri. Maxwell is um, working with the Open Society Justice Initiative uh, from Abuja, Nigeria, but uh, often uh, finding himself all across the continent. And we know that uh, Maxwell has been an integral part to uh, the drafting of this declaration, and he will speak to the online dimension of both freedom of expression and uh, access to information. Obviously, that has been one of the major new aspects to incorporate, and um, Maxwell will enlighten us about what the declaration says in this regard. Thank you very much, Maxwell. Um, good morning, um, colleagues. Um, 
from Abuja. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be here. It's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, and let me begin by thanking the organizers or the conveners of this um, under the ABLE leadership. Of Hello. Am I Sorry, let me, let me just again ask everyone else except the speaker to mute your microphones, please. Uh, uh, close your microphones. Thank you. So, um, thanks, Pro, uh, Prof. Villion. Um, let me begin by thanking um, the organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity and for convening this all important meeting or conference, as the case may be, which could not have come at a more opportune time. Um, to Commissioner Mute and the team, I want to say again a very big congratulations uh, on this success. Full uh, adoption of this document and its public launch, and then speaking to it at this convening. Um, as, as, as I looked at the document again and reflected, um, I, I would reiterate the congratulations to Commissioner Mute because, particularly in the context of Part Four, because this took quite a lot of doing. And just to let me let the card out of the bag a bit, when in the earlier in the first iteration of the revision of this document which had been um, uh, ordered by the commission, I think back in 2012, when it, was, when it was considered by the commission in the private session in 2016, and, and that revision was focused on just the, trying to strengthen what was then the part four of the 2002 declaration dealing with access to information. Uh, some, a few of the commissioners, ably led them by Commissioner Mutie, made the point that revising just part four and not looking at the entire declaration was a non-starter because you would then have a lopsided document where one part is much more current and the other part are extremely dated. And one of the points that was flagged was the issue of the internet, you know, both in the, question of, in the context of access to information and freedom of expression. And when in the, in the later iteration, which then happened under Commissioner Mute's leadership, this was one of the areas where, we had, where there was a lot of conversation. And to the credit of Commissioner Mute, he made the point that he, he needed to not only understand, but also be convinced and also become a strong advocate. And when we look at where we are now globally in the context of the pandemic, I could not, it, this document could not have come at a more opportune time as the earlier speakers have said, including Commissioner Mute. And most importantly, part four. Um, from the beginning of part four, which is principle seven, 37, sorry, right up to principle 42, because part four is essentially built on six broad principles. It just speaks to every single aspect of what we're currently experiencing now. And I will just begin to drive home that point by asking that we look at principle 37, which talks about access to the internet. There's no gain saying the fact that our lives now have moved online. And as, had been, as was said in Commissioner Mute's introductory remarks, and I also think by the moderator, that we are involved in so many online meetings now, much more than we could ever imagine. And not just online meetings, but even online education. So when you look at principle 37, where it says that states have a responsibility using the expression shall to facilitate the rights of freedom of expression and access to information online and the means necessary to exercise these rights, it just sets the tone, and which is now a lived reality in the context of the COVID pandemic. When you go back into looking at the 37 sub 2, which also speaks to the fact that states shall recognize that universal, equitable, affordable, and meaningful access to the internet is necessary for the realization of freedom of expression, access to information, and the exercise of other human rights. There are four expressions I want us to just, I mean, focus on or think through or reflect on. The expressions are states shall recognize the requirement for universal access in the context of the internet, equitable access in the context of the internet, affordable access, the issue of affordability, and then the other issue of meaningful access. So all of these are four conditionalities that need to be met 
by way of recognition and facilitation by state parties to the charter. The other bit is that in recognition shall in cooperation with other state stakeholders adopt laws, policies, and measures to enable the provision of those four conditions I had earlier spoken about in the context of the internet, but that should be done without discrimination. Again, linking this with the, uh, some of the comments Commissioner Muti made in the overarching principles, one of which had to do with non-discrimination. Now, going further, again, speaking broadly in the context of the internet or access to the internet, it talks about ensuring that marginalized groups are also able to exercise their rights effectively online. And then last but not the least, which again is now a lived reality in the context of the COVID pandemic, that states shall adopt laws, policies, and measures to provide affordable access to the internet for children that equips them with digital literacy skills for online education. As many of you would know, teaching now has gone online, at least speaking for the country where I, where I reside in Nigeria. Most of the schools, primary, secondary, and in some uh, level, some level of tertiary where that is still, a bit, it's still able to operate, are currently doing their courses online. So again, the, 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 this part, portion of the declaration was actually ahead of its time, as if it envisaged that we will get into this challenging circumstance where the internet then becomes a tool for education, not just at the level of tertiary, but at secondary and primary level that affects children. But it also speaks to the critical importance of issues of safety of children from online harm, as well as protecting and ensuring safeguards for their privacy and identity. So you can then see the overarching importance of the declaration's principle in the context of ensuring fundamental access to the internet. The next principle, which I will just quickly go on, and I'm, I hope I'm not being too fast, Franz. If I am, please let the interpreters or yourself let me know. But I'm trying to work within my eight minutes. The next principle is principle 38, which speaks to the whole question of non-interference. Again, instructive, would not have come at a more opportune time that states shall not interfere with the right of individuals to seek, receive, and impart information through any means of communication, including digital technologies, and through such measures such as block, as removal, blocking, or filtering of content, unless such interference is justifiable and compatible with international human rights law and standards. And that states shall not engage in, con in, engage in or condone any disruption of access to the internet and other digital technologies for segments of the public or an entire population. On the continent, in different parts of the continent, several uh, populations have experienced internet shutdowns. And when you look at this particular provision of Principle 38.2, it speaks spot on, aptly, about issues of internet shutdown and discourages states from engaging in any form of internet shutdowns, whether it is for particular segments of the population or the entire population at large. But it just doesn't stop there. It also goes in, in article in principle 30, 38 sub 3 to say that states shall only adopt economic measures, including taxes, levies, and duties on internet and information and communication technology service end users that do not, again, going back to some of those earlier expressions, do not undermine universal, equitable, affordable and meaningful access to the internet and that are justifiable and compatible with international human rights law and standards. In parts of the continent, including, for example, in some countries in Eastern Africa, there are experiences with taxes on over-the-top uh, services, OTT services, which creates an additional burden on the population. What this particular provision speaks to are instances like that among several others, basically saying, any economic measure that undermines universal access, equitable access, affordable access, or for that matter, meaningful access should not be taken on by states. And that even in circumstances where states are minded to consider some of those economic measures, they must be premised on grounds that they are justifiable. And in terms of justify, being justifiable, Commissioner Mute had referenced the applicable conditions in the overarching general principles in the first part, but also the fact that even where those uh, economic measures are justifiable, they still must be viewed with the lens of 
are they compatible with international human rights standards? So it's not an either or, but a combination of both. Again, with a sense of ensuring advancing the whole question of non-interference in the context of access to information and freedom of expression online. We quickly move on to principle 39, dealing with internet intermediaries. Again, there's a lot here that, can, that needs to be unpacked, that time would not allow us to, but I would just want to reference one or two very quickly uh, for purposes of, of, of uh, emphasis. It speaks about states not require, shall require that internet intermediaries enable access to all internet traffic equally without discrimination on the basis of the type or origin of content or the means used to transmit content. And that internet intermediaries shall not interfere with the free flow of information by blocking or giving preference to particular internet traffic. Could not have been worded any better. Goes on in 39.2 that states shall not require internet intermediaries to proactively monitor content which they have not authored or otherwise modified. Again, the whole question of surveillance and then internet blocking by member states. The other bit I would just want to speak to very quickly is that states shall require internet intermediaries to ensure that in moderating, that is even when there is even a need to moderate or filter online content, that that process must ensure in, do, in, in designing that process, they must ensure that the mainstream human rights safeguards into such processes and adopt mitigation strategies to address all restrictions on freedom of expression and access to information online, including ensuring transparency on all requests for removal of content, as well as incorporate appeal mechanisms and offer effective remedies where our violations occur. Again, speaking to the wisdom of this provision in the particular context of ensuring that internet intermediaries in doing, take, taking on their role, ensure that the overarching consideration must be the promotion and protection of human rights, particularly the rights of access to information and freedom of expression. And that even where they have to basically monitor or take down content, there must be transparency mirrored through it, and there must be appeal mechanism incorporated in, those, in that process, and there must be remedies where rights violations occur. Again, there is a lot that can be said in the other parts of Article of Principle 39. Um, four, five, six, but time will not allow me to deal with that. So I'll quickly go on to another very important principle worth looking at very closely, which is the issue, principle 40 dealing with privacy and protection of personal information. This is one part of this conversation that has basically gained currency in the context of the COVID pandemic. You, I mean, many of, many of the participants, and I'm sure there will be a robust conversation of this, there's been conversation on how the internet and IT apps have been used in ensuring ad proper tracing and tracking in the context of um, basically containing the COVID pandemic. But that also has challenges for issues of privacy and personal and protection of personal information. Again, which creates this conversation that the de revised declaration provides leadership for in terms of basically letting states know what to bear in mind, even in the context of using these technologies or basically ensuring containment of the pandemic. Two examples of what it speaks about is principle 41, that everyone has the right to privacy, affirming that right, including the confidentiality of their communication and protection of their personal information. That needs no explanation. Two, that everyone has the right to communicate anonymously or use pseudonyms on the internet and to secure the confidentiality of their communication and personal information from access by third parties using the aid of digital technologies. Three, that states shall not adopt laws or other measures prohibiting or weakening encryption, block including backdoors, key escrows, and data localization requirements unless such measures are justifiable and compatible with national human rights law and standard. Again, speaking to the fact that even in exceptional instances where, that, where those can be considered, a key consideration needs to be that they must be justifiable and the standards for justi justifiability being contained in overarching uh, principles in part one of the declaration applies, as well as the other key requirement that they must meet with international human rights norms and standards. Principle 41, also looking at privacy from the perspective of communication surveillance. 
again, speaking to the fact that states shall not engage in or condone acts of indiscriminate and untargeted collection, storage, analysis, or sharing of a person's communication. Two, that states shall only engage in targeted communications and surveillance that is authorized by law that confirms with international human rights law and standards that is premised on specific and reasonable suspicion that a reasonable crime has been committed or is being carried out or for any other legitimate aim. And that where states are minded to this, they shall ensure that any law authorizing targeted communication surveillance provides adequate safeguards for the right to privacy, including about six um, standards that have been included there, which include prior authorization of an independent and impartial judicial authority, due process safeguards, specific limitation on the time, manner, place, and scope of the surveillance, notification of the decision authorizing surveillance within a reasonable time of the conclusion of such surveillance, proactive transparency on the nature and scope of its use, and then effective monitoring and regular review by an independent oversight mechanism. Again, even in the context of the pandemic, this is also quite apt. We, when we were discussing the issues of contact tracing as well as tracking using new technologies. But it's also not just this. We also know the challenge of micro-targeting in the context of elections as well as disinformation in the context of elections. Again, all of these are issues that can be addressed in the context of Principle 41. And there's a lot that is, that, that is embedded in both Principles 40 and 41 that will take quite some effort to unpack in terms of its application. And that affords the Commission, hopefully, a robust opportunity of addressing some of these issues in both its pro protective and promotional mandate in the context of its engagement with state parties. Last but not the least is Principle 42 which deals with the legal framework for the protection of personal information and encourages states to adopt, basically mandating, not even encouraging, pardon my expression, to adopt laws for the protection of personal information of individuals in accordance with international human rights law and standards. And also in principle 42.2, basically outlines the processes that need to be taken in the context of processing personal information of individuals, which must be done in accordance with the law. And some of the things flagged there include the fact that this must be done with the consent of the individual consent, conducted in a lawful and fair manner, in accordance with the purpose for which it was collected, and adequate, relevant, and not excessive. So you cannot overreach in terms of what you collect vis-a-vis -vis the purpose for which the information is being collected as well as it being accurate and updated and where incomplete it needs to be erased or rectified and transparent and disclose the personal information held as well as being confidential and kept secure at all times. It also speaks to the fact that states shall ensure, I'll be wrapping up very quickly, Franz, I know, I know you, are, you are trying to give me the cue, that states shall ensure in relation to the processing of a person's personal information that the person's that the person has the right to be informed in detail about the processing, ac access personal information that has been or is being processed, object to the processing, rectify, complete, or erase personal information that is inaccurate, incomplete, or prohibited from collection, use, or storing. There's a whole lot that is also a, a embedded in principle 42. But it's what suffice it to say that in the context of part four, which is dealing with ATI, access to information and uh, freedom of expression online. The principles, the six principles have been are so robust and so well thought out, and pardon my, pardon my own analysis, that it provides the most progressive, at least till date, guidance from Africa's uh, numero uno human rights mechanism for not only member states, but also human rights institutions, as well as human rights defenders, on how we engage on these issues of access to information and freedom of expression online, but even goes beyond that to also deal with issues of privacy, whether it's be in the context of communication surveillance, whether it be in the context of personal information, or whether it be in the context of how you process personal information, including by state parties. I thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, Maxwell, as always, very succinct um, and very animated uh, expression of the issues we appreciate. Um, I can just uh, note again 
that uh, we were um, at least 150 participants. People come in, in and out, but we were we uh, reached a, a plateau of around 150, which is great. And noting all the regions in Africa uh, being represented from people in the chat box uh, from Southern Africa. We have South Africa and Namibia. We have from Central Africa, Cameroon, from North Africa, Morocco, from the West, obviously, Senegal, Gambia, Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, and from um, the East, Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda. I'm sure there are many others. If you want to post in um, the chat box your presence, affirm your presence, but also pose any questions you may have, we will, after this last uh, panelist, uh, go to the questions and discussions. So the last panelist uh, is uh, Tlengiwe Dube. She's based at the Center for Human Rights. She's working with and heading our unit on expression, information, and digital rights. And um, she has been spearheading from our side the support for this very process of uh, the elaboration of the declaration. So thank you very much, um, Tlengiwe. And we listen to you in terms of the way forward and um, also uh, the context again of COVID-19. And as I um, ask you to take the floor that I may just remind everyone to mute their microphones, keep them muted as we listen to the speaker. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, greetings, everyone, um, from um, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you very much um, for, for your participation. Um, as uh, Prof has indicated, um, my name is Lengi Wedube. So um, I'm going to speak about the way forward in general, and I am also going to take the conversation to the um, COVID-19 um, context, uh, I would like to encourage you to make use of the, uh, the chat option and um, um, raise your, your comments um, um, about the, the, the conversation um, there, uh, because I don't think we will have um, enough time for, for the question and answer session, so we can utilize that option. So without wasting time, um, I just want to uh, make reference to um, principle 43 of, of the declaration, this revised declaration. So uh, that is the last principle. This is um, where I'm taking um, from, uh, from Maxwell's presentation. And it's on implementation, hence uh, the title of my presentation, which is the, the way forward. So under principle um, 43, I would look at, uh, I'll start by looking at the last uh, bit of that principle, which is on state reporting. So um, in terms of uh, part four, it says in accordance with article 62 of the charter, states shall in their periodic reports that are submitted to the African Commission provide detailed information on the measures that have been taken um, to facilitate compliance. So this is just to say, um, and then I'm sure we are all aware of the state reporting process where um, state parties submit um, their reports after every two years to the African Commission. So again, in those state reports, um, periodic reports under Article 9 um, section, at least there has to be an indication of how this present declaration um, um, has been um, has been implemented in in that um, in that state party. So just to note that this declaration, the way it's um, the way it has been designed, it can serve as some kind of a checklist for the state party um, or for the government department where that is responsible for for state reporting. So it, it serves as a checklist to um, uh, kind of tick or assess the areas of success and, and challenges um, is with regards to freedom of expression, um, access to information and the online aspect. And also um, just to remind the civil society of their role in, in state reporting that um, they have to provide also shadow reports in addition to taking part in the process of, of drafting the, the actual report, there is also an element of shadow reporting. 
So this also serves as a checklist uh, for the civil society to uh, check on the government's performance and also to comment on the state party's report. So we have been provided with an easier way of access, assessing uh, state compliance, at least in that um, uh, process of state reporting. So I just wanted to um, make a point uh, about state reporting. And um, point three says that when state parties adopt measures related to elections, they shall be guided uh, by the guidelines on access to information. So this is to also indicate that the African Commission has developed a set of guidelines that are specific to the electoral period before, during, and after. Um, and this is specific to um, uh, elections. So when, again, um, during the context of elections, that is a very good instrument to use to assess the compliance of the different stakeholders uh, that are involved in elections. So I just want to uh, make reference to um, a research um, or a study that we are currently finalizing as the center. So what we did was that during the South African elections last year, we uh, initiated a, a study on the South African compliance. We are in the process of completing that process, but we were looking at um, the different stakeholders like the electoral management body, the civil society, the political parties on how compliant they are with regards to um, proactively disclosing information that is relevant to, to an electoral period. Um, that, that's on elections. So I, I wanted to uh, make it uh, clear that there is, uh, in addition to this, to this declaration, there is that specific instrument on elections. It's available on the Commission's website in English, French, Portuguese, and Arabic. Um, also, the declaration uh, states that when states review or adopt legislation on access to information, they shall be further guided. They shall be further guided by um, the African Commission's uh, model law on access to information for Africa. So this is a model law that the Commission adopted in 2013. What it is, is that it's an example. It's a model. It's, it's a standard of how an access to information or freedom of information law could look like. So it's a yardstick that um, a government can use when they are developing a new law on access to information or they are reviewing an already existing um, law, but um, on the realization that it has gaps and there is need to revise it in line with international human rights law and standards. So the, the, the model law gives us that, that example. So the point is not to say uh, that the state party should take um, the, the model law in its entirety because we have different contexts in our different jurisdictions. So is to use uh, the model law to just, just as a guide and um, use it for the uh, particular, uh, for the peculiarities or the, uh, the uh, characteristics of, uh, that we have in our different countries. So this particular model law will be very important for, um, I'll give an example of um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has an access to information law that was adopted around 2002. So every time when we are counting countries that have adopted access to information laws, we count Zimbabwe because of AIVA. But if you look at the provisions of that law, it has um, exemptions that are, narrow, that are very wide in such a way that it restricts access to, to information. It hinders access to information. So at the moment, Zimbabwe is in the process of developing a new, um, a new law on access to information. So this is an opportune time to use the model law on access to information for Africa and also to use this uh, present declaration. Um, so um, because if, if these have been drafted according to international human rights and standards, 
to avoid the, the danger of coming up with another AIPA that uh, will likely, if these standards are not followed, like, um, likely uh, produce another AIPA, which um, doesn't save the process. Um, so um, I also li would like to make reference to the South African case. For a very long time, um, PAIA, with the protection of um, um, uh, the, 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 the access to information law in South Africa, PAIA, for a very long time, has been viewed as a very progressive instrument. And, but now when we are looking at the model law, and when we're looking at um, this particular declaration, there is an emphasis on proactive disclosure on information, maximum disclosure of information by public bodies and relevant public bodies. So in a way, PAIA has been overtaken. So there is now need for PAIA to be updated in line with the model law to elevate or to include proactive disclosure. As we have seen that what is in PAIA at the moment is um, a process of accessing information law where you approach a public body and request information and complete some forms. And that process, we have seen the weaknesses. But when we di proactively disclose information, it saves the time um, uh, and also um, saving people on a one-on-one uh, -on -one basis, uh, but you are able to save the public uh, in its entirety when the information is proactively disclosed in the website, for example. Um, also, there are countries that are going through um, constitutional review processes, such as Sierra Leone. This is also an opportune time for such countries to make use um, of these standards, such as this declaration that has been developed. And uh, principle 43, the, the first section, talks about adopting legislative, administrative, and judicial, and other measures uh, to give effect to the declaration. So um, it's about implementation. At the end of the day, the provisions that are in this declaration, the provisions that are in the model law, in the guidelines, are supposed to cascade down to national level and find expression in the legislative um, instruments that we have and um, the, the access to information laws or the, the media, media laws that, um, that, that regulate the media should draw from these provisions that have been, from these standards that have been adopted uh, by, by the African Commission. We have a guide, we have a standard. So the, the most important thing is about implementation. And when these laws have been adopted, the most important thing is to make sure that they are implemented. I just want to draw your attention to um, the, the, the work that Commissioner Mute does or the work that the mandate of the Special Rapporteur does is assessing implementation of Article 9 rights. And um, one of the ways that the, the Special Rapporteur does that is to undertake tours to countries when it's necessary and assess the implementation of these rights. So in 2018, Commissioner Mute undertook a, mi a mission to Nigeria to assess the implementation of uh, the freedom of information law that was adopted in 2011. A very good law, but the implementation levels are very low. So um, the, uh, the report about that mission is available on the African Commission's um, website and it details the challenges around implementation of, of that particular law, which um, also include um, funding the process. You find that the, 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 the mandate to oversee the implementation of, of that particular law rests within the, the Ministry of Justice. And within that Ministry of Justice, there's a very nice setup of an, of an um, information unit, but it's under-resourced. So as long as it's under-resourced, it affects the whole implementation process. So this is a call to even state parties that at the end of the day, when these instruments have been established, they have to be implemented. Resources have to be added for the purposes of implementation. Certain um, institutions have to be developed to support the implementation. 
for example, in some countries, um, freedom of information laws are under uh, the, the implementation is overseen by the Human Rights Commission. In other countries, you have an information regulator, like in South Africa. Um, in other countries, they, 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 they differ, but at least there has to be a mechanism to oversee the implementation um, of, 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 of that particular law. Um, so I just wanted to highlight aspects on implementation. So um, let me quickly go to the, the COVID-19 um, context. So yes, uh, if you could do it summarized uh, way, please, uh, Lengiwe, so that we allow sometimes for Okay, Prof. Um, so the declaration is, um, is being released by the, the African Commission at, at such a time when we are faced with this crisis. And uh, the, we are seeing the importance of the rights of freedom of expression and access to information. And whilst other rights are, are being limited, like our physical movements are being limited, there's a right that has been elevated, which is the right of access to information. There has never been um, a time when this right is more important than, than ever. We need access to information in this particular context. And uh, the Special Rapporteur has encouraged uh, the use of this declaration in ensuring that responses to COVID-19 pandemic do not interfere with, with rights that are enshrined in Article 9, in Article 9 um, of the Charter. And it's also important to underscore the, the, the importance of um, uh, the role that is played by media practitioners and, and journalists. And in that context, it's, it's important to ensure their safety. Their physical safety, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because we have seen that in different countries, um, journalists have been attacked by police in enforcing the, the different measures that have been adop adopted by government whilst on the line of duty. And I just want to make reference to a statement that was released by the Media Institute of Southern Africa, the Zimbabwean charter, uh, chapter. Um, it stated that the enemy is the pandemic, it's not the media. This was after the realization that journalists were being arrested um, on the line of duty. Um, so th that's a very important issue to consider. And also beyond the physical uh, protection of journalists, there is also the need for, for journalists to be provided with um, uh, 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 personal protective clothing. Because we are seeing when you, when you check online, you see that journalists, some of them have, uh, have lost their lives to the COVID pandemic. They are on the line of duty, they are on the front line, they are more exposed than others. So hence the need um, for, for more protection. Here in South Africa, um, one of the media houses recently uh, lost um, a camera person to, to COVID-19, um, which, is, which is very sad. So uh, the Special Rapporteur has um, appealed to, to states to guarantee um, uh, respect and protect, and protect the right of freedom of expression and access to information by ensuring that there is access to internet and social media services um, during, during this time. So um, I'll just zero into um, access to inform access to, to internet because um, whilst the, the digitally connected world, we have um, managed to, to make a, a, a swift shift and made use of the internet. Uh, we are using Zoom, Google Meet, um, um, and, and all manner of platforms. But uh, this is not um, the case with, with others. So hence uh, the importance of uh, this conversation around access to internet. And the declaration in terms of principle 37 um, states that uh, states shall recognize universal, equitable, affordable, meaningful access to internet. And uh, principle 37 again talks about um, provision of internet um, to also to marginalized to marginalized groups, um, and this um, access to internet also finds expression in the sustainable development goals as well. And in terms of the situation in, in Africa, uh, this is where we are. Our population is around 1.3 billion, and only 39% of that population has access to internet. We have good examples such as Nigeria, Kenya, Tunisia, 
uh, you, um, Senegal, Morocco, that have over 50% internet penetration rate. And then we have those that have below 12%, 12% and below, such as Sudan, Somalia, um, Eritrea. I'm trying to move fast. The cost of data is one challenge. We have uh, countries such as Eswatini, Seychelles, Guinea-Bissau, uh, that if a cost of data of one gig is between 21 US dollars and, um, and 12 dollars. And then we also have um, um, positive um, stories like in, in, in Egypt, as of the end of last year, the cost of data was um, around a dollar something. Um, in South, Southern Africa, the lowest cost is, um, is, in, is in Mozambique. Um, we also have such um, measures that are introduced by governments, such as social media texts that are also restrictive. A uh, case in point is that of Uganda, and that also uh, reduces the number of people that use social media. In terms of digital, um, we have digital exclusion challenges, div digital divide challenges, uh, digital uh, illiteracy, media illiteracy, um, low incomes, there is a large segment of the African population that is living below a dollar. And when you look at the cost of data, um, it means there's, those are competing, competing um, interests in a family, for example. Uh, if you look at the cost of data, one would rather buy the base, what, what would then be basic commodities instead of buying data. Another challenge that we face in Africa is that of internet shutdowns. I, I, I can't um, emphasize this. Um, um, it has been overemphasized. I just want to mention the, the, the aspect of um, uh, persons with disabilities. Um, I think we need to continue to hammer hard on, on this because uh, they face um, their peculiar challenges. And um, it, it's very important to, to note the cost of um, assistive devices that are used by persons with disabilities. And uh, that speaks to our policies, government policies around that. I think um, as civil society, we need to do a lot of activism around that area. Um, and um, we and ensure that uh, information is available on, on um, um, formats that are, uh, um, um, that are um, uh, applicable to, to persons with disabilities. For example, like in, in this situation right now, we need everybody to understand what COVID-19 is about, the preventive measures, the, um, everything that has to do with the, the, the measures that have been taken by, by the government. You also yes. need that information to be yes. available to <clears throat> persons with visual impairment. And... Okay, moving on to uh, women. Uh, just to, to do one, one, 30 seconds, Lingi, with Lady. Otherwise, we only have five minutes left for questions, please. Um, I maybe let me just mention the challenge. I think it's very important to challenge, mention the challenge that is faced by women in, in this context. That is, they, women use um, online platforms, exercise their freedom of expression. That space, which is supposed to be a safe space, um, is turning out not to be that safe space because of the violence that women are facing online, including the non-consensual uh, sharing of intimate images. And this is a situation that uh, silences women and makes uh, some, um, some of the women who would otherwise want to use the, the space um, be afraid of using um, such spaces. So basically um, the idea uh, when we are looking at um, the way forward is to adopt the necessary measures, legislative measures, um, a judicial and other um, uh, administrative, make use of the model law and access to information, the guidelines, and ensure effective implementation. I just want to highlight that um, last year when we commemorated Access to Information Day, Universal Access to Information Day, we were in a celebratory mood, not because of something that has happened in Africa, but in India, where the High Court, the Kalara High Court declared that um, 
access to internet is a fundamental right. And this year, the Supreme Court of India declared that um, access to, inter to internet is a fundamental right, and also in the same vein, denouncing internet shutdowns. So it is also our sincere wish in, on the African continent that we could also be moving towards that direction where um, access to internet is a fundamental right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tlengiwe, for that very rich uh, way forward perspective and also bringing in again the COVID-19. Um, thank you to our five panelists and thank you to everyone who's made some uh, comments and put some questions in the chat box. I encourage everyone to still do so. I still remind you to keep uh, your microphone muted. I will now pose just uh, one or two questions from the chat box to uh, uh, some of the speakers, the panelists. Um, first of all, Commissioner Mute, I think some of the questions relate to the implementation of the declarations provisions that it is a, a very good document, but um, what specific safeguards are there? What specific implementation is there related to the existing mandate uh, of promotion and protection of the commission? Is there anything that goes beyond? Is there any specific form of or perspective on the implementation? And I think a second question, if I may, Commissioner Mute, that is linked to this one, is what would be your suggestions about an advocacy uh, approach or strategy uh, for, let's say, the next five years or so? Because the declaration is there, but how does it get um, taken up and uh, given wings to fly, as it were? Commissioner Mute, over to you. Thank you, thank you. I hope I can be heard. Um, so, quite quickly, I think um, it's important that when we discuss implementation, we take a medium term view. I think far too often, when new instruments are put in place, uh, people are in a hurry to get uh, results and to have finalization, and clearly that doesn't happen. Um, so I think in the medium term, uh, there's a number of issues. One, uh, clearly uh, states need to know about this declaration. States need to know that uh, this declaration is established in terms of the charter, which means that while this declaration is not hard law, it is what we call soft law, but actually it's soft law which is mandated by hard law which therefore means that states, by being party to the African Charter, they are actually obligated to implement uh, the declaration, the principles. So I think that message needs to go out there loud and clear. Now, does, there will need to be continuing uh, engagements, continuing uh, discussions uh, with states. As uh, colleagues have pointed out, we have a number of uh, procedures. Uh, for example, we have our, our Article 62, a reporting procedure, uh, which can be the basis for engaging states on uh, implementation. But I think a number of other issues, I look forward, I really do look forward to stakeholders around Africa bringing before the commission cases which actually are triable. So triable cases which can come uh, under the communications procedure of the commission uh, which then uh, would be determined and the declaration would be useful for that purpose. In fact, I would say that in the last one or two years, uh, we've had a couple of uh, communications which have been uh, uh, finalized and which have been uh, uh, following up on Article 9 issues. And I would look forward to more of those in the medium term. So I think quickly, those are the, some of the two issues, issues uh, I would highlight. Of course, um, I'm hoping that uh, uh, even as uh, I, I leave my mandate, uh, perhaps I can still uh, uh, prepare um, a simplified uh, uh, document which actually will introduce and explain uh, the declaration and which you can put on the website. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mute. I think um, uh, we will just allow maybe three or four questions and I ask the speakers, the panelists, to be as brief as they can. Um, I think um, 
Maxwell, um, someone has referred to principle 41 and 42 and said and asked that you kind of interpret them in the context of tech, tech companies, especially those business models who have business models solely based on surveillance, mass collection, and synthesization of data. And one also in this context looks at um, e-government platforms that uh, are collecting massive um, you know, amounts of personal data. What um, the, do the principles um, and the guidelines say? Uh, does it give, do they give guidance uh, on issues that had been referred to here? Maxwell, please, over to you. Well, um, thanks a lot, Prof. Um, my, uh, am, I, am, I, am I audible? Yes, please, go ahead. My, my response would, would be yes, absolutely. Um, because if you also remember, um, in the context of the earlier parts of the declaration, it speaks to the fact that in the context uh, of the responsibilities under the declaration, that particularly we viewed under the lens of access to information, that it is not applicable yeah, just to member states. Não é aplicar, isto não é aplicável simplesmente aos Estados Membros. <laughs> Something is coming, translation is coming through, it's not just applicable to member states, but also to relevant, isto private, isto é relevant private bodies, which in this context, interpreted broadly, would also imply the big tech companies as well. So in terms of the provisions of principles 41 and 42... Maxwell, Maxwell, yeah. Let us just ask the Portuguese uh, trans interpreter. We can hear your voice uh, over the speaker's voice. Can you just check, please, that it's not audible? Uh, thank you, Maxwell. Yeah. Okay. So, so like, I, like I was trying to say very quickly, that my answer would be yes, that the principles enunciated in principles 41 and 42 certainly do apply to those institutions in terms of the big tech companies. Because if you look at the earlier parts of the declaration, it also speaks to the fact that the principles enunciated in the declaration, particularly in the, under the lens of the access to information uh, rubric, is not limited to just member states, but also to relevant private bodies, which viewed in that context would also include the big tech companies as well. Thank you so much, Maxwell. I think Mugambi, unfortunately, I have a message has power problems and may have left us. But may I ask Fatou, Fatou, someone raised the criminalization of uh, non-factual information in the context of COVID-19 as an issue and asked how does one draw the line between freedom of expression on the one hand and uh, the spreading of misinformation online on the other? And uh, what would the guidance be of our declaration in terms of in a situation like this? Fatu? Did yes, you, uh, did uh, that? yes. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, principle 22, uh, uh, sur les, uh, donc uh, le principe 22 sur les mesures pénales, principe la entier, uh, même en période de difficulté. Il est vrai que uh, dans ces circonstances difficiles, uh, il est recommandé et de plus en plus uh, les lignes directrices sortent pour rappeler aux organes de presse, euh, aux acteurs de, 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 de s'abstenir, de, 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 de diffuser des fausses nouvelles. Euh, et beaucoup, beaucoup d'éducation, de, 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 beaucoup de sensibilisation doivent être faites. Mais le principe reste entier que dans, la, dans le principe 22, il est recommandé, comme dans, le premier, dans la première déclaration, que les États ne doivent pas criminaliser euh, la, la diffusion de fausses nouvelles. Uh, ceci, en quelque sorte, uh, est une constante, mais aussi, il faut dire que dans beaucoup de contextes, c'est très difficile, uh, uh, dans le contexte du COVID-19, il y a beaucoup d'États, de plus en plus, ici au Sénégal, par exemple, il y a quelques semaines, uh, des menaces de, 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 de poursuites ont été proférées parce que des, des individus uh, uh, circulaient des, des fausses informations sur la réalité, l'existence ou non du COVID-19, qui peut être aussi un danger pour la santé publique, mais euh, il est important de faire les équilibrages et de rappeler les normes, même pendant des périodes difficiles, comme cette période-là, euh, ne pas déroger systématiquement aux bonnes pratiques, mais plutôt privilégier le dialogue 
et aussi euh, la sensibilisation et partager les bonnes informations. Euh, la solution n'est pas de, de, de poursuivre, mais c'est plutôt de mettre en avance les bonnes informations pour contrer les fausses informations. Et c'est ça les recommandations et les bonnes pratiques. Et ce que réitère euh, la, le principe 22. Thank you very much, um, Fatou, for, for that. And then, um, Commissioner Mute, most questions I think are, are addressed to you, and maybe I can take this one. Um, the question is really um, about how the Commission itself, uh, maybe you're not there at, uh, for, for so long, but how does the Commission itself ensure that uh, the principles around freedom of expression and access to information set out in the Declaration are effectively given content in its own practice and activities and procedures. Um, for example, sometimes people have frustration about accessing information. I, I myself know that concluding observations, one often sees that they are adopted, but you um, have great difficulty seeing the full text of these concluding observations. And the, the, question, the person posing the question said, the principles enjoin states to ensure that marginalized groups are able to exercise their freedom of expression and have access to information, but the Commission itself seems to have acquiesced to pressure from the political organs, especially subsequent to decision 1015 from the Executive Council uh, by withdrawing the observer status of CAL, the Coalition of African Lesbians, which creates the impression that some marginalized groups cannot freely express themselves on equal terms with others before the Commission. What has been done by the Commission to address this um, seeming uh, anomaly, in other words, that the Commission in its own practices and procedures may sometimes fall short of these lofty uh, declaration. Commissioner Mute. I think, um, let me begin by saying that even as uh, the Commission establishes uh, um, standards, so new uh, normative uh, standards, I do not think that the Commission, for one moment, goes to Africa where it does not have humility. So we come before Africa with humility. We come before Africa and all stakeholders, and we say that we have been given a mandate. We try to execute the mandate the best of our ability. We are not self-righteous. We are not sanctimonious. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. And so when we have that in mind, in the same way that a state will enact legislation, and in the same way that then in the practice of legislation, there would always be issues, there is nothing then to say that uh, um, similar situations cannot arise in the commission. Now, in terms of the uh, practical, the, the actual uh, question, so obviously we know the context, uh, you know, the coalition uh, of African lesbians and the context around that, uh, the initial decision to um, uh, give them observer status, I believe it was in 2015, uh, the politicking uh, which went on uh, around that, the uh, filing of, um, um, I, I think, a proceeding before the African court, uh, the failure of that proceeding on, a, I suppose it was a technicality, and then the fact that in due course, then uh, that issue had to come again uh, before the African Union, and the commission had to be put on the spot. Now, I think what I would say is that obviously there is extreme tension between the roles which the commission necessarily has to play as part of implementing its mandates. So on one hand, you have the commission's uh, protective mandate. On the other hand, you have the commission's uh, promotional mandate. And uh, how you implement those two effectively always would remain a challenge. What I can say with confidence is that as far as the protective mandate is concerned, that really is protected. 
I mean, it's it's a uh, it's 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 sealed. It's there's these walls around it. It's protected, which therefore means that, uh, for example, a state could not interfere with the communications process, with the communications procedure. Now, the question of promotion is a little more complicated because promotion is about speaking with people, is about speaking with states. It's about diplomacy. It's about diplomacy. So yes, um, uh, how do we deal, how do we ensure that uh, um, we get to have you know, sexual minorities also uh, participating fully uh, in, the, in, the, in the commission's uh, uh, activities? That I think would always be an ongoing issue. Um, as I said, we hope that everything gets done in the short term. It doesn't work like that. These things uh, are engagements which continue on an ongoing basis. So um, on other technicalities, I mean, um, concluding observations, uh, actually, I would say that concluding observations nowadays would be available on the website as soon as the activity report for the particular a period has been adopted by the uh, by, by the by the by the, um, the the relevant organs. Uh, obviously, in, in practice, if uh, then they are not available for I don't know one week, two weeks, one month, two months. I suppose then that's a, a practical problem of uh, whether the logistics are in place, whether the secretariat has all the personnel and manpower it requires, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so really, I, I think what I would really want to emphasize is that we come to Africa with humility. We try to do our best. Our reality is that from day to day, uh, particularly around our promotive uh, functions, we have to deal with politicians. We have to deal with states. Uh, and uh, sometimes then uh, we come under the sorts of pressures uh, which must have resulted uh, in the uh, 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 pushback uh, which happened around the call. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mute, for uh, uh, really answering those questions. And um, I think um, we have uh, also um, Mugambi back, I believe so. But I'm also aware that we, we have now extended ourselves beyond the advertised time. And perhaps uh, to also accommodate people who need to leave, I could ask a kind of a two-layered question and then ask each of the panelists maybe to address that question and to make any concluding remarks that they would want to make. But before then I do that, I'll just um, uh, once again thank all the participants, everyone who came into this meeting, to this webinar, and um, advise you that there is a recording made of this uh, proceedings, these proceedings, and that that will also be shared with you so you can share those further as well. So the question, I mean, in a way, synthesizing it from questions received, uh, would be that uh, there's a sense in which the declaration um, is quite extensive, but quite um, clearly it cannot encompass every element. So perhaps how do uh, the panelists see the declaration evolving? What, what aspects could be uh, teased out or ameliorated or added upon? So looking a little bit ahead at the, at the future evolution or of, of aspects that may, may not be covered and could be linked to the existing declaration. And then lastly, uh, the question that someone asked, what would be uh, one's view of the main legacy of the declaration? Maybe like what is the primary uh, legacy that this declaration uh, would leave. So maybe I take the invert, inverse order and uh, I ask uh, Tlengiwe to uh, uh, address those questions and make any final remarks, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And um, uh, thank you everyone for the, um, for the contributions that, that you've raised. I think what, what I can just say is that um, uh, just to, to reiterate uh, Commissioner Mute's um, point that um, this is not a new instrument. New instrument, yes, it's a, slow, it's a soft law instrument, but it is building on um, an existing provision, which is Article Article 9 of, of the Charter. So it should be taken um, in that context because um, our state parties in Africa have already ratified the African Charter. So by extension, um, 
this um, instrument also applies to, 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 to state parties that have ratified the charter. Um, for me, I would like to see um, more emphasis being made on the dissemination of uh, the provisions of, um, of, of this declaration so that it's known, so that it's used together with the model law, together with the guidelines. There has to be um, greater, um, uh, this is an appeal to civil society to assist um, in disseminating the provisions of, of this declaration and make sure that it's known and um, develop advocacy and also to um, appeal to our um, support that we get from the donor community to support the work of the commission around um, uh, the work of this uh, declaration, especially in making sure that state parties understand what is entailed in the declaration and how to make use of the declaration so that when they are engaged by the commission during the stage reporting process, they, are, they understand the obligations that are um, under this um, um, uh, declaration. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tlenkiwe. Uh, Maxwell, if you would like to address those questions and make any concluding remarks, thank you. Hello? Hello? Am yes, I please, go ahead. Yes, yes, go ahead, please. So, th thanks a lot, uh, Prof, uh, for good moderation and for synthesizing those questions very, very um, succinctly. Um, very quickly, um, certainly, um, I think the, the, your question speaks to part four. I mean, speaks to the entire declaration, but has a lot of relevance for part four because looking at the entire declaration part four is pretty much branding, you know, and there is a lot that is embedded in the provision of part four that needs a lot of unpacking. So on the one hand, I am minded to, uh, I'm actually very glad about the point raised by Commissioner Mute about uh, CSOs and other stakeholders bringing tribal cases in terms of communications before the commission, which would avail the commission an opportunity of actually shedding, a, shedding more light on the pro, 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 provisions of, of part four. And when you, do, when you juxtapose part four, which is basically dealing with uh, uh, not just freedom of expression and access to information on the internet, but also the key issues of privacy, both privacy of personal information and privacy, of, uh, privacy and communication surveillance, as well as legal framework for protection of personal information, you would see that the, it, those are live issues that we are currently experiencing, that we've been experiencing pre-COVID, you know, including in the context of elections and electoral uh, dispute and electoral conduct and elections management, but as well as even just in the context of managing uh, an economy. But more importantly, they've now been driven home very starkly by the COVID experience because of the extent to which technology is now running our lives and is going to run our lives a whole lot more going forward. You know, and so that has that is smart right, right, smart right, left and center part four, and raises a lot of issues that I'm hoping would come before the commission or will be brought before the commission for interpretation and give them an opportunity to further expand the scope of the declaration and by extension expand the provision of Article Nine, Article Nine of the of the Charter, as well as the fact about there is there is there is, there is also um, in terms of legacy and um, um, opportunities to going forward, there is also ample opportunity for further expanding on the declaration, including in the context of all the issues that are embedded in part four, as well as this whole question of the protection of personal privacy, which needs further iteration, but which part four serves as a very good starting point. Uh, if I may just step beyond part four and speak just very in passing, I'm not taking on uh, Mugambi's role in the context of um, part three, which is dealing with access to information. There's also going to be spoke, scope for actually looking a bit more closely at the importance of proactive disclosure, particularly in the context of pandemics. You know, because not just prior, because we talked about proactive disclosure mostly uh, from a procurement perspective from a policy uh, framing perspective, 
from pushing for compliance by stakeholders and building greater confidence and synergies between the government and the governed. But in the specific context of pandemics, the proactive disclosure becomes essential and a critical tool for containment. Now, how that becomes deployed and whether we do need a new set of principles or declaration on proactive disclosure and pandemics will be something left for the Commission to think about in the next uh, cycle. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maxwell, for those provocative and instructive comments as ever. Mugambi, um, have you been able to join us? If so, please, uh, could you take the floor with your concluding comments, please? Uh, thanks, Prof. Um, I, I can see Maxwell did not wait until I, I you know, left before he, he decided to venture into the area of recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Maxwell, for uh, touching one of the comments I really wanted to make. Um, around um, one of the comments I wanted to make around um, access to information. So um, are there things that we would like to see done? Uh, I think the other speakers have covered a number of them. Um, I, I guess for me the, the big one is, is, is something that uh, Commissioner Mute put out, put out there, which is much as we we should be looking at this in terms of medium term to longer term implementation is also for us not to see it just as um uh, you know a, a function of the state uh to, to promote uh this declaration i think there's a huge scope for us as uh, non-state actors and people within civil society to um is essentially uh, um Take, take the material we have and, and do a number of things. Uh, one, of course, is to challenge on national legislation uh, to comply more with this, this charter. Um, but also, I think within communities, um, some of these provisions actually affect uh, directly uh, communities that um, are seeking, for example, information around uh, the pandemic or for some of them is, is their, their socioeconomic rights is to take, take this, let's take it down there. Um, let's not wait for the states to do it. Whereas the responsibility of the state, I think uh, there's something we can do there in terms of seeing uh, what we can do uh, with these provisions. As I said, they're largely progressive. In terms of legacy, um, I think Maxwell has, has mentioned uh, you know, the whole question around the way the world has changed just given the current situation. I'm hoping one of the legacies is that um, the coincidence in terms of time between uh, the occurrence of, of COVID-19 and uh, the promulgation of, of, of this declaration um, allows us uh, to actually uh, uh, bring home um, um, this, this piece, uh, this piece of, 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 of this declaration um, in the sense that uh, there's an opportunity here to see if we can test, we can rigorously test, uh, um, you know, um, some of its provisions uh, and see if they work or don't work in the various territories or regions we're in. So, so I'm, I'm finding that as, as, a, as, a, as something of a, legacy, of a legacy that we can build on. The last one, the very last point, is around some of the continuing um, challenges we will have. Uh, for me, clearly, the, the whole uh, debate and interpretation of, of, of some of the terms, for example, relevant uh, private body, um, it, you know, some of these debates will go on and whether they are uh, wide enough, I think they are, but I can see people pushing back and, and, and trying to uh, exempt some private entities that clearly need to be held accountable in terms of access to information. Um, so I, I can see that as a continuing debate, and maybe that's on an issue we we should uh, help uh, the commission with in terms of a, a tribal uh, case for it to declare itself in terms of, of clearing uh, um, that 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 seg segment of you know what exactly uh, who exactly is in that scope of of the declaration. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Mugambi. Also, for those additions, uh, we go to Fatu. Uh, Fatu, for your concluding reflections, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Franz. 
Uh, I think the, the renewal of this declaration uh, is very timely. Uh, as uh, already said, uh, uh, going forward, uh, I believe uh, it's important to, to look uh, into uh, working further with regulators. Uh, I know that uh, uh, over the past years, a lot of emphasis has been uh, made on working with the state civil society, especially uh, free expression related organization. But I believe that also most of the measures uh, that are taken or that the states generally are taken in relation to uh, freedom of expression in general, uh, they, 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 they use the conduit of uh, media regulators, uh, especially the, those uh, 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 dealing with the broadcasts and other, other, other areas. So it is important to engage them uh, in terms of educating them on, on, on the, the importance of the declaration, educating them also on issues around regulation and how they can incorporate the declaration in their work, in their policies. But importantly, also most of the regulators have an important role to play in terms of advising the state when legislations are made. In many countries, if you look at uh, the regulatory bodies, they play a consultative role when states are making decisions uh, or uh, enacting legislation in, in, the, in the sector of, uh, uh, in, the, in the area of media freedom. So I think it is important to have that in mind. Uh, the, other, uh, the other important thing I believe as a, as a way forward is also to further engage the African media. I think we've not done it enough in the past decade. Uh, there have been some, some alliances here and there through the African Editors Forum, through the different networks, but I believe African media have been the missing link in the human rights protection in Africa. We've seen hardly see them in, in sessions unless they, uh, is, uh, some of them in the host countries. We need to have a strategy to engage them because of course this declaration is for everybody, is for freedom of expression, but I think the media plays an important role in vehiculating the information emanating from the commission, its decision on, on, on cases, its decision, and all the policies and the standards that have been set by the commission are not trickling down in the national, at the national level uh, because also I think the media has not been playing uh, a, 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 an important role there. We need to find a way of engaging them in this second phase. Uh, the, the, uh, the other third one is technical advice. I know that the commission has attempted here and there to advise government when at when, when it is needed. This role must be more proactively, uh, I think, used, utilized. Uh, and I think we need all to play a role in our different countries to ensure that when there is a process, either constitutional review, either, either legislative review, to ensure that the commission uh, in its, the different mandate, especially the special reporter, uh, is uh, in touch with those processes so that at least they can, they can not only share the guidelines, but also offer uh, concrete assistance to ensure that the, 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 the legislations at least are, uh, are taken in line with, uh, with the, 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 the recommendation of, because we see a big gap. Uh, generally, the commission is only of a, of this legislation when states are reporting, but we don't see the internet interconnection when those legislations are developed. Lastly, but importantly, protection. I believe that more and more journalists and uh, human rights defenders are attacked on the continent. Uh, there is a lot of impunity. There are many cases that have not been resolved. And I think this declaration gives us another formidable opportunity really to address the issue of impunity and prioritize it uh, within the mandate of the special rapporteur. Really uh, going forward, I think the declaration gives us uh, really uh, fresh air again to, 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 to chart the way forward in the next coming uh, 10, 20 years. It is a, 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 a great declaration. I remember the first one, everybody said that it was one of the best, I believe, as Max said, it's not because we were all part of this under the legislative of commission, but I think this declaration is very inspiring and it will help, it can help us to, to move uh, a lot on the continent. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you uh, so much, Fatou, for those inspiring words. And then lastly, we uh, give uh, Commissioner Mute, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, the floor to give his um, concluding uh, perspective. Thank you, Franz. Um, I think several things. It's important uh, for us to keep in mind that states are our 
very important stakeholder. States have to be part of this conversation because if they are not, then uh, nothing moves. And uh, I think uh, I, I was quite happy just looking at the participants uh, who uh, were part of today's discussion. I believe I saw names which I could associate with the delegates who usually come to uh, some of our meeting, uh, state delegates. I'm sure I saw one or two who I could say, yes, I believe this must be a, a state delegate. So it's important that this conversation, even as it has been happening, has been happening uh, with states, uh, obviously also with the others, uh, civil society organizations, and I'm sure many other people uh, as part of this conversation. So that's, that's important. Now, in terms of uh, what is important, what is the legacy, what are these uh, critical new things that the declaration introduces, I, I think what I would say is uh, the discussion should not be academic. So it's not so much about what is important theoretically because uh, depending on one's situation, you'll find that one or other of the uh, sections of this uh, declaration would then be of most relevance to yourself. Uh, so sometimes it will be about uh, your safety as a journalist. Sometimes it will be about um, uh, the extent to which as a citizen, you're able to access information in order you know, to protect your reputation, in order to uh, exercise your rights. Um, and of course, then again, it could be uh, issues which uh, relate to the internet. Um, obviously, the instinct, I, I usually try to restrain myself from agreeing with Max uh, because uh, we had you know, all those huge discussions about uh, how we frame certain things. And uh, I had uh, to make sure that uh, our feet remained on the ground. But yes, uh, the whole part four clearly establishes uh, extremely important uh, new things. But I do remember, you know, many years ago, when I began working on uh, media issues, um, it's also, it was also about uh, things like community broadcasting. And so the question must be, what are we saying about community broadcasting today? What is the relevance of community broadcasting today, even uh, in, a, in the context of, of, of the internet? How do we ensure that uh, people in informal settlements are still able to express themselves, are still able to get um, uh, information uh, which uh, is necessary for their livelihoods. And so uh, I, I think all these sections, all these parts are extremely important. Now, um, the question of self-regulation, and most recently, uh, you know, when we went to Namibia, we found that obviously self-regulation can have challenges and so you go back to having now a discussion on how do you frame core regulation? And I think that was one of the comments uh, which one of the participants uh, just made. Um, you notice that uh, the African Charter does not legislate a right to privacy, specifically so, uh, the right to privacy uh, in the African Charter. And uh, so you see what we in due course did uh, with principles 40 and 41 was then to frame issues of privacy, but I kept insisting, I kept telling uh, everybody that uh, we could not then begin saying that in this declaration, we were legislating fully across the board on air right uh, to privacy, because then, you know, there's so many issues which you could not cover in this one declaration. So I would expect that perhaps uh, at some uh, future uh, point, the commission would speak uh, you know, more broadly to the broad now uh, question of the right to privacy, because clearly that's an outstanding issue. Um, the question of uh, the extent to uh, which uh, the declaration addresses all the things that it should or could, um, we need to, I, I always distinguish between what I call principles, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, establish a broad uh, frameworks, uh, on the basis of which details work can be done, usually at the domestic level. And then also you can have guidelines which are more specific, they're more nuts and bolts and uh, issues. And you notice that the commission sometimes uh, uh, legislates uh, or 
you know, adopt principles. Sometimes the commission adopts the uh, guidelines. So one has to sort of try to figure what the nomenclature uh, actually means. Um, what I would wish to stress is perish the thought that we want to begin writing more things into the declaration now. And that's why I'm saying this is not a short-term thing. It's a medium-term, it's a long-term thing. Uh, I'm not sure, although I'm, I'm not sure that uh, you really want to begin saying, uh, let's make uh, changes. Because really, uh, as everyone is saying, uh, and as we were drafting this, we were hoping, expecting that then this would become a basis, um, which then could work uh, for a long while. So really, I think one also has to be practical um, in terms of how this thing goes. I, I think the question of the charter, uh, uh, yes, I think, I think then perhaps just to make my final um, comment, and I think it's simply to express a belief uh, which I have uh, stated in the past um, and the belief which uh, I have stated is that um, Article 9 of the Charter will continue growing and it will continue growing with the times. So it will continue being interpreted uh, in the light of what will be happening at the particular point in time. So um, the conditions which will be present at the particular point in time. So I really uh, expect that this declaration is uh, one more element of this continual, continuing interpretation of uh, parts of the charter. Um, and clearly, uh, the commission recognizes that there are areas uh, which uh, uh, still require interpretation. I don't think perhaps we've done enough work around the uh, duties and you know what all that uh, entails at a practical level. But um, it's been uh, a joy, uh, you know, working with all of you, uh, all stakeholders, state and uh, state actors, uh, the Center for Human Rights. Um, uh, there are many people who, are, who I'm sure are uh, uh, and have been part of this process who uh, may not have had opportunity to speak today. Uh, you know, media rights agenda. Um, very many of you who actually have supported uh, this process, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the work which we've done. And clearly, the proof of the pudding is in the. I don't know if it's in the eating or what. Um, so. Let's see how this goes in the medium term. And I am happy that uh, uh, the instrument, even in, as in its present form, is uh, assisting stakeholders as they are dealing with the practical issues, uh, such as the ongoing uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. So I think, uh, Professor, uh, ladies, uh, gentlemen, uh, it was a pleasure uh, being part of this uh, 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 webinar. I think my sense was that let's introduce this, uh, let's have discussions going, uh, because then this can be the basis on which, moving forward, you'll be appealing to us, perhaps to communicate to states using letters of appeal. Uh, you'll be communicating to us. You'll be asking us to make interventions uh, on violations, on Article 9 violations, which are happening. So it was important uh, that we have this discussion. In due course, Whenever the next session, uh, whenever the next face-to-face -face session of the African Commission takes place, I am sure that there will also be a formal uh, launch uh, of the declaration. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mute. Um, let me then conclude our session by just again thanking everyone who participated for your time, your presence here, your contributions in the chat room, your questions. I think it was um, an excellent panel. Uh, I think the purpose of the event, namely to introduce and to uh, ensure greater and deeper reflection and start and contribute to the process of a deeper and further dissemination of this declaration has been achieved. 
Uh, I thank everyone involved in the event, the panelists um, at the center, Yolanda, Teruna, Klingiwe, who assisted, I think the Secretariat of the Commission, Eva, and others, um, everyone who assisted in making this possible. I think this was also a first for me personally, a first uh, webinar where there was simultaneous interpretation. I tried to listen in here and there and it seemed to have done, gone very well. So I thank also the interpreters for their services and for those helping us to set this up. But uh, the greatest thank must go to um, those who were drafting and contributed to the drafting of the declaration itself. Uh, we celebrate today uh, officially uh, also the um, declaration, its content and its possibilities. And, and the person obviously spearheading that was also spearheading and guiding us in putting this event together, uh, Commissioner Mute. I, I appreciate you personally. I think everyone involved in the team appreciates you for someone who has the big picture in mind, who can lead with vision, but also has the ability to have meticulous attention to detail. And it's, it's really exceptional to see those qualities. And I think that uh, assisted in driving this process forward and even getting this uh, webinar done. So once again, um, the recording will be made and um, has been made and will be disseminated to everyone present. I see that even you know, we've uh, transgressed, if you like, uh, we've gone 40 minutes beyond the advertised time, but by far the majority of participants are still present. I think it is um, homage to the interest and the um, excellent nature of this webinar. Many of the comments in the chat box also show appreciation. So one last word of appreciation to everyone who made this event possible. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Commissioner Mute, the team, and uh, we wish you all um, a safe and sane uh, sojourn wherever you may find yourself and ways uh, of exploring how to further disseminate and use the declaration that we spoke about uh, today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.